Thank you so much for watching my show, William Wallace for America. I am William Wallace, and with me today is State Representative Wayne McMahon. Wayne, thank, uh, Representative McMahon, thank you so much for being on today. I really appreciate it. Well, appreciate the invitation to be here with you this afternoon. Well, you know, whenever I look at those district numbers, you know, you, you got you to gotta picture, is it a, a legislat legislative uh, representative or a senator's seat? Because number one, I think, starts in the top left of the state. And, now, you know, uh, when it comes to the representatives and or is it or then the Senate starts down at the bottom right. Is that correct? Yeah, the uh, the representatives start in the top of the state and, and the Senate starts in the bottom. And I'm in District 10, which is uh, in the northwest section. Uh, my northern line is the Arkansas line. I live right here in Spring Hill. Um, been here all my life. Grew up here, came back and worked here and raised my kids here. I can go out my back door and walk to Arkansas in about three minutes. Are you serious? You're that close? I'm that close. I, if you had talked just for a minute, I could probably go to Arkansas and come back and not miss much. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good that, 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 that's you that's unique for one of my interviews that, that, that while we're on the interview you could walk to arkansas and back and uh, we won't even know it although although yeah. arkansas is one of those states like mississippi and and texas everybody's saying that we need to be more alike you know if you can go there and come back with some more uh some more good ideas which it <laughs> sounds like you're doing you know that we'll be all right <laughs> well that's true you know I, that's one thing i'm I'm concerned about. I think we're at a pivotal kind of time in our our country and in our state in Louisiana. You know, COVID brought a uh, influx of people to the south. After COVID oh, really? was over, there was people from California, the northern northeastern parts of the country. They're moving to the south. You know, we were losing population still in Louisiana. Uh, I don't think we're seeing the people relocate here, and I think that fundamentally tells you we've got some issues we've got to work on. We're not attracting people like Texas or Florida or Tennessee or North Carolina. Um, or Arkansas. I, I think, you know, or, or Arkansas. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Well, so I, I, I'm glad that you shared that, um, that statistic. I didn't know that after COVID, more people are moving to the South. You always hear that more people that other states have in migration but I didn't realize that it was so so um, centered on the South where they were moving, and that makes it even more that, that makes it more of a highlighted, I guess you could say, that we're not getting the influx of population like the states around us are. And it sounds like this legislative body is really in tune with trying to make that happen. Are you? Do you think that's the same? Do you agree well, with that? I think that I, I would agree with that. I think that's true. I think that's a the issue we've had looking at the redistricting, we lost a Senate district and a representative district in Northwest Louisiana to the South part of the state. And uh, that speaks of our population. My population, uh, my district is all of Webster Parish, which uh, four years ago, uh, I had about 39,000 people in Webster and I got the rest of my district out of Lower Bozier Parish, which was about 3,000 and some odd people. Well, now my district has changed to the north end of Bozier, and I'm going to have to pick up almost 7,000 people in the north end of Bozier. So with my my district declined, so I had to dip over further into Bozier to pick up a more populated area to uh, fill my district out. So, And that's happening across North Louisiana. Bozier City itself is one of the areas that's grown. But uh, I think you see the population shift that we've had is to South Louisiana. I don't know. I think this last couple of years, the population kind of helped its own, but over the 10 years, I think we declined in Louisiana. Yeah. They're saying an outward migration to Louisiana, but that's interesting. No one really talks about the population shift within Louisiana. I'm glad you're bringing that up representative because it shows where the, where the not only where the jobs are, but where they're shifting, but it also shows where we need more help in our own state. You know, we're always saying that we're losing, you know, uh, populations from our state or population from our state. But when you, you can look at what areas of our state are losing population, maybe we can really focus solutions for those communities to help the state as a whole. Would you agree? I would agree. We've got to drill down. You know, we can, we can look at the state as a whole and see one picture, but if you drill down into the areas of the state and get down to the, to the individual communities, then 
you you see a different dynamic you know i'm right uh, we don't have the industrialization in north louisiana they had when i got out of veterinary school in 1980 i'll tell you a little story about um, I, i'd always go to spring hill it was my hometown i wanted to come back here and practice veterinary medicine well in 79 we international paper company was a, the primary employer in our in my city here in spring hill they population of 2,000 people are a little more going out to work in international paper every day. Well, in 79, the year before I graduated, the, uh, they closed that or announced they were closing the mill. But in doing that, they were going to build a wood products plant that would employ about 500 people. So it wouldn't be a total loss. Well, they moved that mill basically down south in Louisiana. And it didn't, the new mill employed about 500 people. It was just, you know, time had got to the point that technology brought it, they didn't need 2,000 people working. The right. Mill. So they built a new mill, but they built us a new mill. So that 500 people working at the lumber mill really kind of offset and helped Spring Hill move forward and, and kind of keep our head above water at least. But that's happened across Louisiana, North Louisiana in particular, I know. I, I, I like that. When we start, if we can look at those certain communities where we're getting the most outward migration within our state, like you said, with it, we can we can look at an industry or a business a type of business and be able to focus, you know, the needs for the people on those areas. Yes. What type of business? Yeah. What type of business satisfies, you know, that community, so to speak? You say you're a, a veterinarian by trade. Yes, I graduated okay. from LSU in 1980 from veterinary school and uh, attended Louisiana Tech before that. Uh, grew up here in Spring Hill. I uh, raised three kids in Spring Hill. One of them is still here. Two of them are <laughs> scattered a little bit. But, you know, I think that's what we all as parents would like to see. Uh, got four grandkids, and, and unfortunately, none of them live in Spring Hill if we have to oh, travel my. to see them. But, you know, there are people moving into Louisiana for jobs, but there's an outward migration in total, I think. And that's what, you know, we've got to address some issues, some fundamental issues in our state. I think we've got to look at tax tax structure, the way we tax, it seems like a the very popular thing now is no income tax. And right. I have one one daughter and her, her family lives in Texas. Now, they don't have any income tax, but they've got a lot more property tax than we do. Right, so there's exactly. a, a balance. If you look at Louisiana as a whole, I think we rate for as tax per person right in the middle of all the states. We, we're not overtaxing. We kind of fall in the middle. Okay. Just how we do it. And the way we collect it, or those are some things that we've got to refine a little better to make our state a little better from a tax structure uh, to help us move forward. And of course, uh, you move from that and you can move down the road to education and in a community like mine that when I graduated from high school, there was 175 kids that graduated with me. Now the, the school's graduating 120 or 125 in the same community, actually a little expanded part of the community. But we're seeing that across the yeah. northern part of the state. And that, that, that's, like I said, some more interesting statistics. I appreciate that. Well, well, uh, well you've got some uh, some uh, legislation, and you don't have a whole lot of it. And before you before you tell me that what you have, you know, I, I'm going I'm to give everybody a sneak preview that, you know, I kind of like it when people aren't filing a lot of bills. Uh, you know, I, you know, the, I think the momentum seems to be for everybody to file as many as, you know, you got five, you're fill, you know, you're going to file five. If you've got 10, you're going to fill 10. And by golly, during the session, you know, if you could file as many as you want, you know, game on, we're, go, we're rolling. But, you know, oftentimes I think that when people are filing too many, it's the unintended consequences. You got legislation on top of legislation and they affect each other in ways that, you know, sometimes we don't even know. Of course, I'd be a little bit long-winded about it, you know, but I don't know if you would to share any thoughts on that or just share your bill. Well, I'll share my bill in a minute, but I agree with you on that. I think, uh, you know, and this is the least number of bills I've looked at in the five, this will be the fifth fifth uh, session I'll be going to. Um, I've had some bills with dealing with our community college to get it from a technical college to the community college level and through the SACS accreditation. We were there this morning. I think our community college in a, in a rural environment like Webster Parish and, and South Bozer and North Bozer is paramount in giving our kids a chance to uh, get out of high school, maybe get dual enrolled while they're in high school, get a credit or two, and, and learn that they can succeed at that community college level. Uh, right. 
and and it's a it's an inexpensive way to get an education that you can right. take take and get a job and support yourself and a family and you can always go on and continue the education i think it's an overlooked part of our education and and um I'm, I'm, i've been a big believer since i got out and started started working with the community college this is one of the things we need to emphasize in our state so what exactly does your legislation do the legislation that i've got this year coming up this year it's a, a pet cremation bill in in the state of louisiana cemeteries are for, for human remains only and uh, okay. i've had several people ask me um to consider running the bill there was been some prior legislation going back into the around 15 or so and what i'm asking uh in my bill is not not to put anything on the cemeteries that they don't want to do but i'm asking to legalize to include pet cremated remains or pet remains in a casket or mausoleum upon burial you know certainly as a veterinarian from the time i got out of school in 1980 to i retired in 2013 or 14 um the uh, it was amazing how the pets became a huge part of people's family you know uh, they are just another family member and i've had we've, we've had people that cremated their pets and retained their ashes and i know some of them are being included in burials but right now it's illegal so this law would basically make that legal so here's a question, and, and by the way, I want to go back to the the trade schools in a, in a minute. You know, I'm, I'm sorry, I kind of segued kind of quick, oh, uh, quick on, the, on, on that one. Um, but on the on the pet cremation bills, how many times does this affect, uh, or I don't want to say affect the person because if they're dead or the animal's dead, but how many times is the combination there where you know they bury a human and there and the animals? you know, can be buried at the same time, or are you talking about if the... That's that's what that's what I'm talking about, a pet that has already passed away before okay. the person. Okay. Uh, that's what we, you can't go, and we're not asking anybody, we would never ask anybody to cremate a pet just to, to make, make <laughs> the interment at the same time. That's Let's not, and that's up. spelled Let's out, up. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's spelled out in this bill that they can't happen. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I didn't think they were gonna, they were gonna yeah. cremate the the pet just well, because that, the was, died. that was a concern by some people, you know. But I, that's, <laughs> that's not the intent of the bill. That's not the intent of the bill. But, but no, you're you're basically saying so. If somebody has the remains of a pet and they want to be buried yes. with their pet, right now it's illegal, but it yes. does happen. It well, just kind of they, they look the other know, way. I don't know about any any way to prove that, but I highly suspect that. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, what's yeah. interesting is I, I wasn't aware of the, that there's a law that was illegal. And I have heard of people say that when they die, they want the remains of their pet buried with them. And yeah. and I didn't know it was illegal. I don't even know that they knew it was illegal. But but basically, you know, you're saying it happens. People probably look the other way or mm -hmm. it's one of those things they drop in the coffin in the last minute. You know, right. I'll, you know, but you're saying this is just going to make it legal. But yeah. it, does and, this have any personal? They can include certain personal property in the casket or in the mausoleum or in the um, at burial, but uh, the pet is not the pet remains is not, I guess, considered personal property. So right now it states in law that uh, cemeteries are for human remains, human burial. So we're going to include pet remains, and then so we're going to let the, the let the cemetery associations decide if they want to participate or not and they can put their own structure in place for their their cemeteries that want to to participate i like this so this bill isn't isn't going to force a a, no. a, a you know a, a funeral home that they have to it's simply going to allow them to be able to do it if if the family wants that to happen i had this bill last year and I, and i didn't really think i would have much trouble with it but the cemetery associations had some concerns over over what was how they could do that and keep track of everything. And anyway, um, I, I changed it up a little bit, trying to accommodate them. So they're going to be in charge of putting the rules in place. So here's here's something to say. I'm going to go back on, on, on a few minutes ago when I talked about how I wish more legislators were like you filing less bills. 
But, you know, I, I want to say, I'll, I'll say it like this. I wish more legislators were like you in filing more smart legislation and not just a lot of it to file it. And what it sounds like is this is just smart legislation that cleans up some laws that are in the, that, that are in the past. You know, I've spoke to yeah, some other representatives so. that are doing the same thing. They're filing a lot, but their, their bills are actually thought out well enough that they're cleaning up past legislation or bringing past legislation up to date. To this yeah. time, and I, I've I've had several bills like that in the past that cleaned up past legislation, especially in some of the legal sides. So some of the local judges have asked, asked me to go back and run some legislation for them, and and uh, we've done that. Uh, the uh, I'm, we were talking about the community college. You ask a little bit yeah. about that, and uh, right. I'll speak speak to that a little bit. When I when I was first elected. Um, the, our chancellor and um, had decided that we needed to be a, a community college like the other 10 colleges in, in the <laughs> state were. We were the only true technical college left. Right. And, uh, you know, the community colleges, and we, we are a technical community college. That's our forte. But those technical community college degrees, like instrumentation and plant management, industrial maintenance, those are expensive classes to teach. If you can't teach some of the Englishes and the other classes to offset it, it, it puts your cost to the students higher than it should be. So we're, we're working through that with our uh, college here in Webster Parish. And uh, it's also a campus in uh, Kettle Parish and in, in DeSoto Parish. Um, we, we've got nursing programs, we've got uh, instrumentation, welding, truck driving, heavy equipment operators. Uh, those those are expensive pro programs to put in mm -hmm. place. So we're trying to get our SACS accreditation where we can come back and offer some of the uh, basic classes that are a little less expensive, but still can get the dollars to offset the cost of some of the other more expensive programs. And 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 let me know if I heard this correctly, because if I did and, and, and you, you agree, I think it's a great thing. You're basically saying that there's a lot of community colleges that want to add uh, that want to be more than just a community college or trying to be like a regular college, but on a small footprint, you know, where they include your know, English and, and, and certain maths that people don't need to get a technical type of degree. And you're saying you're trying to help fine to the process to where a technical college stays mm -hmm. a small technical focusing on technical skills instead of trying to be the bigger university. Well, this technical college in uh, in in my my district, that has been its mo mantra for fifty something years. They produce uh, people to work in plants like Bentler Steel uh, and instrumentation, uh, linemen that do high lines. Uh, we've got a lineman program we're trying to get online, and the other classes would be for people that are maybe like nursing students that needed to take some other college classes to get their L. PM, the license practical okay. nurse degree. So, and it, it just, it's the way everything moved. We're the only college in of the 11 uh, technical community colleges that were, was purely in a, a different accreditation program. So the accreditation program is hard to work through and takes a little time and some money. But as when you get to the end of that, then you can get better reimbursements to try to keep the cost down and serve. And the main thing is, you know, when you got these community colleges in these, uh, parishes, the rural parishes, it's accessible to these high school students to where they can dual enroll and, and get a look at college while they're still in high school. Right. And, and they can get the confidence that they can go finish that degree and have an opportunity to, to um, have a job that they can be proud of. And not only that, but uh, support themselves and their family. I love this. And it sounds like you know, if if they, if they kind of try to be the unique, you know, keep their uniqueness, if mm -hmm. you will, to being just technical, you're they're going to have to thrive because they're going to bring in people from all over the state to go yeah. you know, to go to that community. So now th those those other those students around the state are going to bypass the bigger universities or the other technical schools to get the specialized training that the one in your district. Uh, Awful. Yeah, and and my our particular school has three counties, so we're not only in Webster Parish; we're in Kettle Parish and we're in DeSoto Parish, and the some of the other schools do. Delta over in the northeast part has multiple parish, uh, multiple campuses with different parishes where it's easier to access, 
the closer you can get the kids to the school, the better chance you're reaching a, a better population. Well, a, a little bit of a shift. I know we've talked earlier about one of the Louisiana's biggest problems of being outward migration, but are there any other things that you see as being Louisiana's biggest problems to bringing in more people and more industry? Well, I do. I, you know, the uh, we, we attract business into the state with the tax exemptions. I would like to see us get away from tax exemptions uh, and and move more to a broader tax base with a lower rate for everyone. Because when tax exemptions are used and and they work for the state, but I really feel like you've got winners and losers. Those that don't get the tax exemptions are competing with some that may have got the tax exemption for whatever reason. So, and in small industries um, that like we deal with here in Webster Parish in our industrial district, they come in and, and they're not sure that they're going to have the, the tax exemption to after they are here up and going. So, yeah, uh, you know, that's, that makes it a little, little tough sometimes, but I would like to see us move away from tax exemption, drop the, the tax rate and broaden the base. So everybody knew what the rules were going to be when they come to the state. And I, I think that have done that, uh, are prospering and uh, attracting attracting business. You know, we've got we've got so many natural resources. We're going to get business in this state. I mean, oh yeah, absolutely. Hain- the Haynesville Shell up here is pre- producing a lot of gas refineries down on the coast. Uh, we've got two rivers. The Red, Red River comes through our area up here and runs down there into the. And I think those rivers. And with that, you've got great farming areas, uh, river bottom areas to farm in. In North Louisiana, along the state line up here where I live, timber is um, everywhere. Yep. Pine timber grows great, you know, and, and uh, people in, have invested over the years in ty- pine timber. Uh, those, those resources we have, and then you go down to the south part of the state, you've got the coast. Um, you know, we've got Shripping, a great coastline. fishing. Yeah, yeah. Recreation. Recreation's across our whole state. We've got a lot, a lot of things that are better than us that don't have near the resources right. that we have. And I think some of the things we put in place, and you're talking about all this legislation, you know, you, there's some things we probably better leave alone with legislation. Too. I love it. Yeah, I love that. I love that thought. You know, it, it, it's it's quite interesting as you're talking about this. What what is the right combination to bring things in, and uh, you know, and what some of our biggest problems are, and some of our biggest problems are, like you said, that we're not letting it go. We're not, you know, not we're using our resources in the in the right way. You know, I look at Louisiana in a in a different way than some people. I'm you know, a little more senior than some of the people that are in the legislature. A little more what you said. A little more senior than some okay. of the people in the legislature. <laughs> I, I've seen a few more days. I'll put it like that. But you know, we we rank way too low when when it comes to poverty. We we're right ranking right near the bottom, and uh, we've got to address that. Uh, you know, we've got to address poverty through uh, workforce improvement. We've got we've got to get those kids out of high school. Mm-hmm. If they don't go to a four year college get them to a community college, get them a degree. If you get those degrees from the community colleges or from engineering schools or whatever, we build that workforce. If if we can have a workforce that people want to use, they're going to come and locate here. But we've got to, we've got to raise that poverty level and we've got to go back and start before school in, in right. pre, pre-K. We've got, we've got kids that are, are behind when they get to kindergarten. And then that makes them behind at third grade in reading. Well, speaking uh, speaking of which, are you are you uh, is, are there is any other legislation you're supporting on education? Yeah, I'm a, I'm going to support Richard Nelson's uh, Representative Nelson's bill on third grade reading. I, I think we've got a uh, an opportunity to do better in the state than we're doing. Uh, I think everybody has to have some accountability, and I think his bill would bring accountability. If you look at, I think. If I, I may be wrong on this, uh, I think Florida was the first to do that. Then Mississippi saw them do it and was working. And Mississippi has uh, adopted that same uh, legislation. Mississippi basically. was ranked lower than us, and now they're higher than us. Yeah, they were like forty nine. We were forty eight or something. Now they're twenty one. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. And that one piece of legislation, and I love what you said. Yeah. 
Go ahead. Well, there, there may be some, I'm sure there's some other pieces to that puzzle to get from 49 to 21, but, you know, I, I, I looked and, and the, the bill looks a little problematic when you first look at it, but it's going to put accountability across the board. It's going to put accountability on the schools, the parents, the mm -hmm. kids and us mm -hmm. as a state to make sure we're funding it and making sure that they have the resources to learn to read. You know, a third grade student, if they're not reading on grade level, they're going right. to struggle in the fourth grade to pass them. And, and then they're not going to finish high school. They're going to somewhere along the way drop out. And, and, and go, go to a and life times. of, yeah, and, and, end up, and, and oftentimes those same people, those same children end up doing, uh, uh, careers that aren't as likely uh, to be uh, legal ones, we'll say. Well, and that's, that's that's sure a possibility, I would think. But, you know, and there's going to be some exceptions. I mean, I've had my, my oldest daughter had some reading issues, and uh, my wife was on top of it. She knew she wasn't reading as good as she should in the second grade, and she kept telling the teachers, no, she's doing fine, she's doing fine. Well, she has some side issues. She had trouble. The first thing to do to read, you've got to see the word. Right. And then you've got to focus on it and you've got to be able to move from word to word. If your eyes are not doing that, you're going to struggle reading. And that's right, a pretty, exactly right. pretty common thing. So it's not all about you can be a smart kid and have a problem and still struggle. Well, recognizing those and addressing those issues. And we don't need to be addressing them in the seventh and eighth grade. You know, it's too late. You know, I mentioned this in another interview uh, earlier. But uh, what I like about this legislation, I, like you said, I like the fact that it's getting everybody involved. You know, all too often in life, it's human nature, you know, that when there's a deadline, we're racing to, you know, racing to beat the deadline. Mm -hmm. Or when you're at the end of the sports game, you know, the energy is higher to, to achieve the goal, so to speak. And, and that's kind of what this legislation does. It kind of says, look, you know, everybody's got to be on board because there's a deadline at the third grade. Right. And if you're not there, and like you said, it's going to bring accountability to parents, teachers, and students. And I think that when, that's when all on their memories or on their brains or on their forethought, they're all going to be working hard for that same goal. You yeah, know? I agree. You know, life life is deadlines. Yeah. You know, uh, from, right. From, from the third grade on. I, but uh, there's deadlines. And, and, you know, I remember in college, you know, the big test on Friday. That was a deadline. You better be up going on Thursday afternoon, Thursday night, and be ready for that deadline tomorrow because it was there. <laughs> and in college, you're happy to put them on a Friday and not a Monday, I bet. Hell yeah, <laughs> for sure. Well, do, is there anything else that you're excited about with this next legislative session? No, you know, yeah, I say no. Yes. Uh, the, the last... Um, the last session of term, you know, of course, elections are coming up mm -hmm. and everybody kind of positions themselves looking at their election, if they're going to run again, if they're not going to run right. again. And, and that's a, in the back of everybody's mind and everything they do and say to a certain extent, you know, and uh, that's, that's a part of, about the fourth term that, you know, is a little bit different than the, uh, the fourth, fourth year is a little different, but, you know, I, I really, Bill, I really believe we're at a point in our state. If we can, if we can come out on the other side with the with the governor that will work with everybody and sit down and be a problem solver, uh, and and look at everybody in the state. You know, you've got. To, I would have to look at everybody in my district as I represent them. You know, I try to do the best for everybody in my district. That's what we've got to do for everybody. In the state, everyone wins. The state wins. I love if it. A few people win the state loses a, a rising tide raises all ships right the rising tide raises all ships correct so uh one 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 more question for you before we wrap up in and you know i i always like to talk about freedom and liberty on our, on our national level i think our freedoms are at risk on our national level do you believe that freedoms are at risk on, on our national level or how how does that apply to louisiana and what do you think we could do about it Well, I think it's it's going back to finding some commonalities. Uh, we we kind of got polarized a little bit in our country, right? Uh, to 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 deferring ends, and and the right way is somewhere in the middle. It's not on either end. 
Right. And, uh, we've got to we've got to sit down and work across across the lines. Uh, you know, for the it's, it can't be red and blue. We've got to put the white back in there. That that part of the flag that we forget about. Sometimes. Yeah. Right. Exactly. It's I love that. It's got to be all of us together. You know, and uh, we we've got to look look at what we've got. You know, one of the things that really concerns me. Uh, is about our country. If we continue on a downward spiral, we're going to be at risk of not only losing the country that I grew up in, but we're going to lose the opportunity to keep peace in this world that we've been the peacekeeper in since mm -hmm. World War II. Right. And when that happens with the 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 weapons that the world could come to the end at any point in time, if we don't remain strong, keep a strong military, and keep our head on an even keel to make sure that we're running our country to be the best it can be and helping the world stay safe. I love that. That's a great, that's a great way to look at it. I, it I, is. Not, 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 only, not only is it fairly unique, but I, the way that you said it, but it's also very patriotic and I really love that one. Yeah. Thank well, you. Well, representative, I, I, is there anything else that you want any final words before we close out? No, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here this afternoon. I got my, Let's see which way I need to go. Oh, there it is. My LSU shirt on. We're going to go watch a little LSU basketball oh, I, here. Tomorrow. I love it. I love it. <laughs> well, I'm going to close out, and then I'll talk to you offline here for one second before you go watch LSU. And, you know, go Tigers. You go know, Tigers. They're, 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 they got they – got their. Uh, I think they're ranked really high right now, right? Number yeah, one. We're, yeah, well, we're, we're ranked, I think, in the top four. It's four teams left for the girls, I think, now. So we're in the semifinals tonight. Oh, you're watching basketball tonight. Basketball. Oh, the boys' baseball is great, too. That's what you were talking about. Yeah, I, th I, thought, I thought you were going to watch it, but I didn't know you were watching That's right, because McCulkey's playing tonight. Yeah. yeah oh, I mean, she's not playing, time. but she's coaching tonight. She's co and, and, uh, coaching. She almost plays when she's coaching. Yeah, she look, she coaches. And the baseball with, team. She's got a great baseball team. Yeah, she, but she, but she, uh, McCulkey, she, uh, she coaches with Sparkles. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. She Rep does. Well, Representative, thank you so much. I'm going to close out the show. Hang on one second after the after this. Everybody else, please share the interview. I always ask you that. It, whatever pro uh, platform you're watching it on, the other platforms are YouTube and Rumble. You can catch it on. This will be a podcast on all podcast apps. Uh, you can also go to Pound L-A-L-E-G-E on Twitter and find me at Wallace for America. But please share the interview because I think the best way – to solve problems in our state is to talk about the issues in a positive way like we did today. Thank you so much and have a great day. Thank you.